So the devil in the dark ages. Now, the reason why I chose this one is because, and I put dark ages in quotes, because the dark ages is, is really a construction by, um, by the enlightenment and certainly the Renaissance, the folks that are thinking that they are in a new age of light and the previous era right after the ancient world was this time of darkness. But um, that was an old view. Right? That's an old view, but people still talk about the period as the Dark Ages. But I think what I'm going to show you today is here's this author from the sixth century who is, um, who is a very dynamic author. He's, uh, he's talking about real issues of his time. And, um, and he talks about them through talking about demons in an interesting way. Uh, so, uh, so, so there's, there's the idea of the Dark Ages. So a demonic encounters in Gregory Tours, which is really what we're gonna be seeing, they're, they're narrative accounts of saints usually, but also sometimes common folks um, that, that encounter demons. And um, so what, 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 can we, what do we mean by that, right? So let's see, oh, I just clicked that. I don't, I don't wanna push that a little bit. Um, so just a few words about how I approach this. Right. Um, so I'm not interested in the truth or falsity of demons, nor am I interested in the truth or falsity of any particular religions when I study them. I, we need to respect them for what they are. But when we just get into, you know, what's true or false, that's boring, I think, because some people can have their belief systems and that's great. But how else can we approach religion? Right. And that's what we're going to find out today here or this evening. Um, so I'm really interested, and here's where I'm gonna come into issues because I see all your wonderful faces, but it's blocking my screen. So I need to move this over here. So let's see. Um, so I'm interested more in how uh, Gregory constructs his world. So, um, so how does he construct his world? He constructs the world through text. And one of the issues I think that comes up is how much does the author really represent the belief of everybody else or, or even a majority? And it's hard to tell, but, but I think what, what we're really dealing with is discourse, right? We're dealing with the descriptions that Gregory gives and he has certain reasons to do these things. And we're gonna see how those all work out as we analyze some of these quotes. Um, uh, so uh, so and, and at, the, at the heart of it, I think we need to understand is that Gregory is in some senses an entertainer because this is a period, you know, before cell phones, before televisions, before a lot of the things we take for granted uh, that would, um, that would be, be sort of media, right? The, the media experience. And, and what Gregory would do and other bishops at the time and priests, the ones who knew how to read, which by the way, was a very small percentage of the population, is that they would uh, tell stories in order to uh, have certain, um, you know, moral lessons involved in it. And, um, and also they needed to captivate the audience. And one thing we're gonna see is that some of these stories are, are pretty, uh, some, of it are, some of them are frightening stories. Some of them are, um, are also ones that really give us some interesting insights into who Gregory was as a person and the world that he constructs in his texts. So, um, so I'm interested in how ideas about demons are used to reinforce his position as a religious leader, right? And his mission to get people to come to the churches of tour. Um, in other words, I think in some ways the, his writings, especially his hagiographical writings or his works on the saints are really advertisements to get um, pilgrims to go to the church and to go to these tombs. Because as we start learning about these saints, we need to realize that they're all dead. <laughs> they're, they, these are stories about them when they were alive. And the reason why um, he talks about them is because their, their power in life is, uh, is mirrored in their power after death. And their power after death comes through um, as relics, right? So if for, if for example, St. Martin, we're gonna be looking at, St. Martin's tomb was a very popular place. and um, people would go there for, to cure themselves of all kinds of different ailments. This is a time before, you know, modern medicine. And so people would hear that, you know, if you have an infliction, you go to this particular saint 
because this saint, at, when the saint was alive, they were able to, um, um, you know, to cure you, to cure people, and they can cure you now. And what you need to do is is either touch the lid of the of of the coffin or touch the lid of the tomb, and the and you could you could be cured from that. Um, and the reason for that is because the saints were the only ones that were that that were not Christ or Mary or God or angels that are now in heaven, and so they were the intercessors. They were the um, kind of kind of the messenger services between this world and the next, and um, and so you know Peter Brown calls it kind of a, a, a holy radiation that comes out of these these tombs and um and it seems to have worked for them i mean if it didn't work in some way now whatever way it worked maybe it's psychological or you know we can get into that but um but it 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 did do something for the people because the people kept coming back and the church of tours became very wealthy because people were coming and bringing money thanking the saint for curing them of various things and this was uh, Gregory's job, right? He was the bishop of that particular church. And then there were also uh, tombs of different saints that he mentions throughout his um, throughout his hagiographies that we're going to look at. So, so these narratives uh, uh, serve as a kind of a pastoral function. They are there to teach the congregation how to act, right? How to believe, what rituals they should um, hold. And, um, and, and, and for us, how do you deal with a pesky demon? Because that obviously was something that people were afraid of, that people were encountering demons all the time. And, um, but let's, let's sort of, and, and it, well, we're gonna get to that in a second, but I also wanted to mention uh, Trinitarian theology. This is something that's important too, before we get, <laughs> before we get started, because in, in the sixth century, the Catholic church had, been the dominant within the West, but there was still pockets of what we call Arianism, or what Gregory calls the Arians. Um, they didn't call themselves Arians, but what they thought instead of a trinity, where you've got the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit as being all co-equal, for what Gregory considered the heretics, they were, um, for the most part, um, subordinationists right so they would have god as as god right but but christ was not equal because christ was his son so the son was lesser than the father as well as the holy spirit so that's why we get the nicene creed right uh i believe in one god uh who is both uh who is who is triune right is who's who has three parts the father the son and the holy spirit uh, but for, for the Arians, who are primarily Goths, by the way, the Goths were, um, seem to have had an aversion to the Catholic belief, mainly because the idea of having your son equal to a father is very difficult to maintain in a, in a monarchical situation, right? Because um, if, if you have an uppity son who thinks they're equal to, to the father, there may that may be a pretext for some kind of a, a revolution, right, or or a, a regicide to get rid of the king. So, um, so I think that was sort of behind it. And and we're going to see when we look at some of these descriptions of uh, of the area of Aryan practices, um, there seems to be this kind of elitism in it um, uh, from from the beginning. And so, so Gregory is someone who, who's also very concerned with making sure that the, his, his flock was, um, was correct in their thinking, right? The Trinitarians and that they were uh, also uh, following his lead. So, so let's look, look into this a little bit and see what we got, okay? So let me move this over. So here's an outline of the presentation. So first I'm gonna talk about who is Gregory Tour. Um, some basics of patristic demonology, um, examples of demonic encounters. And that's really what we're gonna be looking at mostly for this evening. And what do they look like? That was one of my primary um, sort of questions for, you know, how does Gregory describe what they look like? And we're gonna see that they, they take many forms. 
Uh, but there's one scene that you can get to think that maybe this is what he thought a demon really looked like. And, uh, you know, the demonization of Arians, the association of Arians with demons and the devil is very clear. So and on other heretics, but th this particular heretical group in particular was, uh, was singled out. Um, and then with some thoughts about how demon encounters fit into Gregory's unique literary style, because he does have a unique literary style and some may also call somewhat frustrating because um, he, he'll, he'll say some things and then he'll go to a different subject. Um, and we'll see that as it, as it unfolds here. Um, and so, and so also what are, what are the, what's the point of including demons in stories? All right, so we're gonna look at that. So who are the Merovingians, right? So they were um, uh, a, a group of uh, what we consider to be Germanic, right? A uh, group of the Franks who um, under Childeric in the five, uh, 450s uh, took over much of what's today France, Germany, Luxembourg, right? Belgium, all, all this area was under the control of of Childeric and Clovis in particular, who is a son who ruled uh, for about 30 years. Um, but when he, he had four, four sons and having sons when you're a king is sometimes not the best thing because who are you gonna give it to, right? But, but his compromise was just give, all the sons will have different parts of the, uh, of the realm and, um, and they can then uh, figure it out for themselves. Well, they didn't figure it out for themselves much because they fought with each other mostly um, for power. There are a few times where there was some unity under some uh, other Merovingian kings, but it really wasn't until the Carolingians and of course Charlemagne, when they were able to get this kind of, you know, beginnings of what we call sort of the Holy Roman Empire, right? Or this, the, the, the king, of, king of the Romans in a sense, right? So, so we get more unity then. So, so oftentimes the Merovingian period is considered to be this period of kind of disorder, political stagnation. Um, the art is, is really kind of rudimentary and we'll be seeing some of the art in here um, too. So, um, so, so then Clovis leaves us to, this, to his four sons, right? Um, and uh, culturally, um, it, it's, it's a kind of a, a diverse society in which you've got Gallo-Romans who, who Gregory identifies with. So he identifies himself with the group of Romans that came in to take over the area and, um, and has a long family line that was, is related to that. Then you have more of the kind of the indigenous folks uh, the Franks and the more Germanic, the Germanic people. Um, and we already talked about where it is uh, today here. So who is Gregory of Tours? He's Bishop of Tours uh, in Gaul from uh, 573 to 593. Um, he was born into a high ranking family and uh, a number of his family members were also bishops. And that's no coincidence, right? Because th this, this was a group, this was a family that had a lot of power Right, and the way that they uh, maintain the power is through uh, through the church, and so you have a number of church leaders, and and in fact, a lot of the saints that uh, Gregory talks about are his family members, are his uncles and great uncles and and relatives. So uh, and and so we need to remember that, right? Because he's he's really also promoting his family, in a sense, in his writings. Um, uh, Tours was the center of the, um, the cult of St. Martin, as we talked about. Uh, he's the patron saint, is considered to be a very powerful saint. Um, and uh, Gregory wrote a lot of works. In fact, he's in the Monumenta Germana Historica, which is the main collection of the Latin writings that he has uh, of all of his works, which seem to have been mostly preserved, interestingly, uh, because he was a very popular author throughout the Middle Ages and, and even, uh, so, so we have a lot of manuscripts of his. And so his, uh, his texts fill about you know, three, three large volumes, about more than 2000 pages worth of writing in this, in this text, just to give you a sense of how much he wrote. And also to give you a sense that we're not gonna be able to talk about everything, right? We're gonna just talk about some select stories. Um, 
he, you know, Gregory is, is still widely studied today by uh, historians, but mostly unknown to non-specialists, right? So, you know, because why would someone want to read Gregory Tours' History of the Franks, which, by the way, is, is a title given later. He calls it the Ten Books of Histories. But that's probably his most important work was the um, was his histories in terms of influence, but also very important too were his hagiographies, uh, which he wrote a seven, uh, seven books of miracles, a life of the fathers, and he also wrote some things on the Psalms, which you don't have the whole text for, and uh, on the calculation of the stars to know when Easter is going to be. Uh, so, so he he was quite a prolific author. Um, uh, so and and but he's also been criticized by many historians as being sort of superstitious, right? Not a good writer. He's certainly not a, a theologian in the modern sense or in any kind of even ancient sense, but his theology does come through his, uh, his writings. Um, but we already know that, you know, the dark ages was a construct. So we need to get out of that, that kind of view there. So, um, so basics of, if we're going to be talking about demonology, right? So here's just some basics of what demonology is, right? So who are the demons? The demons were angels of God who sinned on their own free will, right? The fall of the angels. And, and that's an important thing to be thinking about because the, the demons still maintain their angelic uh, states in a sense that at least they're, they're kind of physical. You know, if you want to talk about the physics of angels, right? They, they still maintain demons still maintain whatever it was that was angelic. So they're very powerful. Um, primarily, they're invisible, but they can also uh, uh, take take a form on the earth. Um, also, it's important to note that for, uh, for a lot of demonology is really about attacking others, associating, um, you know, heretical groups or pagans or what have you with, with the devil and worshiping the devil. And, um, and, and that still happens today, right? I mean, still there's, uh, you know, if you're, not, if you're not with me, you're against me, right? If you're not on the good side, which is mine, my side, you're evil, right? And we even hear the term evil used very clearly in politics, right? So it, it's that subtle association. So, so this is not too different from kind of what's happening today. Um, uh, but but Christ's passion on the cross, so so the fact that that Jesus died for 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 people's sins was also a victory over the demons. But it wasn't a, a complete victory because that victory is going to happen at the uh, the second coming, right, of Christ when when the apocalypse happens. And then you know, be, read the book of Revelation. You want to talk about a scary story? Book of Revelation is all filled with monsters and destruction and, and sickles mowing down people, right? It's thousands of people, right? With, um, you know, the blood coming up to the bridle of a horse for, you know, uh, 300 kilometers. You know, that, that's, the kind of, um, that's the kind of end that's going to happen according to the Book of Revelation. And, uh, and uh, so, and, and Gregory is always there to remind everybody that that's the case, right? That, that this, that there will be a final victory, but for now we, we need to deal with them because they tempt us and they trick us and they try to get us on the, on the bad side. So, you know, um, misery loves company, I guess, right? Uh, but, but the important thing is, is that uh, the demons are not responsible for our sin. They, they, they set us up, right? But then it's, it's a temptation but the fact we need to move beyond that, we need to follow Christ, right? That's that's really what their what his point is, um, and they they exist as an oppositional concept, right? So so they are the other, the demons are the ultimate other, and they are the ones that are in uh, battle with Christ that will eventually lead to their own destruction. So that's the story, um, and we'll see they're often you know, they're associated with darkness. Filth, right? Filth comes up a lot. Uh, base instincts and desires, and they cause diseases. That, uh, in fact, most diseases at the time were somehow considered to be uh, some kind of a, a, a moral failing of, uh, of folks because they uh, were tempted by the devil or they're, they're possessed by the devil. Um, they're invisible like angels, but they can appear in various forms. 
Um, and, and that's what we're gonna be looking at pretty closely here. Um, and only the true religion can expel demons with the sign of the cross. You're gonna see the sign of the cross is all over the place. And, and, in, in, and, and it's also in opposition to Aryan Christianity because uh, even though the Aryans may have used the sign of the cross, it was, didn't have the same symbolic value, which I don't know, by the way, I, I don't know if the Aryans used the sign of the cross, but, but the sign of the cross is loaded with this idea of father, son, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, right? It's all linked in as one, and it becomes kind of a symbolic gesture. Um, and then only with the second coming will Christ and the devil be uh, finally vanquished. Okay, so what do demons look like, according to, to Gregory of Tours? Well, usually they're invisible. I already talked about that. Associated with darkness. And also, interestingly, uh, smoke and vapor. We hear them in a relationship, usually when they disappear. And we're going to see demons disappearing in smoke and vapor. Um, of course, they're, they're revealed through possessed individuals, right? People who are possessed act like they're demons. Um, uh, they appear in disguises and can shape shift. In fact, they can sh sh change their shape in, in, a, in a particular scene, as we'll see, or, or a chapter a as a way to torment some of these poor saints <laughs> before... Um, uh, but before they're vanquished, right? Um, so, uh, uh, so they if they they can physically interact with people, and um, and we're going to see that they can throw rocks, they can uh, come, uh, you know, appear as snakes and fall on you, um, and but their actual appearance is is quite scary uh, for the uh, for Gregory. Okay, so there are many stories of, of demonic encounters. Uh, this is just a sampling of stories taken from Gregory's vast works on history and historiography. Uh, focus on these stories that illustrate common themes in his work, such as warning against sin, promotion of Trinitarian theology, and the power of the sign of the cross as an affirmation of faith. So that's something that continues throughout all of these narratives. Uh, a, a few accounts are longer, uh, and we're, our first account that we look at is, is probably one of the longest ones that appears in Gregory's works, but we're not going to look at all of it because the last part of it is kind of a, uh, is, is more of a theological uh, sort of musings that he does. Um, but sometimes they're just mentioned in passing. Um, so so they're, they're so demons are so common that he'll just, you know, mention demons in passing. Um, and also many of the stories he heard from pe the people involved. Uh, some of his own personal accounts of demons and the possessed, which we're going to see here. And uh, as one scholar noted, he's the master of the anec anecdote. Right? So you're interested in hearing some stories? All right, because that's all I got. So, so, so that's a good answer. So let's look at some of these stories. Okay, let me move this over. Okay, so this is this is the devil that appearing as a serpent, which we could probably understand is quite common, right? Because the Adam and Eve story, uh, which by the way is only interpreted that way as as the snake being the devil by the Christian tradition, the Jewish tradition doesn't see it in that way. Um, so here, here's Saint Kalupa. Saint Kalupa put together a small oratory in the desert, where as he used to tell us with tears. So this is, a, this is an account that he heard from somebody, from, saint, from Kalupa, who eventually became a saint. Um, and by the way, being a saint in the early Middle Ages was not being a saint today. You don't go, the Pope doesn't do it. The Pope has nothing to do with it. it, it, it they're holy people, right? The, the saint was just another, they're called sanctus, right? They're holy, holy people, but we translate it as saint. So um, he used to tell us with tears that snakes uh, often, used to fall on his head while he was praying and twist around his neck, filling him with terror. And since the devil often takes the shape of a wily serpent, there can be no doubt that it was he who attempted this attack. But the saint stayed quite, quite still and was not moved by the attack of small snakes. But then one day, two enormous snakes, right? Two enormous serpents, which he calls uh, dragons, basically came toward him and stopped some distance away, one of them stronger than the other, and I believe the chief of every temptation, so the devil himself, right, puffed out his chest and raised his mouth, 
to the height of the holy man's mouth as if he wanted to speak to him. Right? So what's going to happen to St. Cuthbert? The saint was so terrified that he stayed as rigid as bronze. He was not able to move a limb, not even to lift his hand to make the sign of the cross. But that's because that, because he's so petrified, he can't even move. Um, and after they had both stayed silent for this long time, it came to the saint's mind that he could say the Lord's prayer to himself, even if he could not move his lips to say it out loud. When he spoke in silence, his limbs, once had been enchanted by the arts of the enemy, began to relax a little, a little by little. And when he felt his right hand free, he made the sign of the cross on his face, right, the, the dragon's face, and then turned to the hydra. Now he's calling him a hydra. So it goes from a small snake to a dragon. And then you've got the hydra from, uh, you know, Greco-Roman mythology, this frightening beast. But he stands in front of him and makes the sign of the cross. And then so he subdues him. And then what does St. Capula do? Uh, he stands in front of the hydra and scolds him, saying Christ will conquer him one day. So he's basically, then he taunts the, the demon. And, and he goes in through this whole thing about the history of salvation and what's going to happen to the demons, which I'm not going to get into here. Um, but, but this was basically to teach his congregation about, about Christ's triune nature, right, the Trinity, and his victory over the devil. And this was, of course, to give some confidence to the, the listener to say that they too, right, if they, if they are faithful and they know how to use the sign of the cross, which we're going to see a lot, they're going to be just fine. Okay. Now here, here, this is another one. This is probably one of my, this is one of my favorite. I've got a lot of favorites, but I really like this one. And this one is just in passing. And this is about St. Venatius, right? So he's, and he's a, he's a pretty powerful saint anyways, but, but check this, check out what he does. So raising from bed one night, uh, he saw two great rams in front of his oratory door. So he was, he was getting up to pray. And he saw these two huge rams there, as if they expected his coming. And as soon as they saw him, they charged him with fury. So here are these giant rams. But what does Saint what does Saint Venatius do? He opposed them with the sign of the cross and saw them disappear. And he entered his oratory unafraid. All right. See, that's 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 a that's a badass saint right there. Right. He's able to just go in there. And, and dispatch them. He didn't have to go through the ordeal that the other, uh, the other one did. He just dispatched them immediately. And that's the kind of diversity of stories that we see. Um, so what else does a demon? So a demon will appear as a ram, right? We saw. Uh, but they can also appear as flies. And there's a, there's a long history of flies. Flies are disgusting. And, 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 and that's what a lot of the people from the past have always, they complained about flies just like we do today. And flies, of course, are associated with filth, just like demons are. Uh, they're associated with death, right? They, they go on dead things. And they're also, you know, seem to really love, you know, poop, right? You know, you, your dog's poop, your cat's poop, you put them outside. The cats love, I mean, the, uh, the, the flies love it. So uh, that was, that's something, they're, they're already kind of a polluted uh, animal to begin with. So it makes sense that they would have appear as a fly. But, but here, here's this story. In the territory of Portier, a, a priest named Panachius asked for a cup when he sat down at a banquet with friends. After he received it, an annoying fly buzzed around and tried to pollute the cup. A priest shooed the fly away with his hand. When the fly flew up again and tried to return, the priest knew that it was the trick of the enemy. In other words, this is this is the devil now. This is you know, this is not your normal fly. He took the cup in his left hand and made a sign of the cross with his right hand. Right, the cup shattered into four pieces, and the liquid in it, after a wave had been tossed in the air, was spilled on the ground. For it is obvious that this was the trick of the enemy. And 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 what I really also like about this is is this scene here which is also almost in slow motion, right? This cup shattered into four pieces and the liquid in it after a wave had been tossed in there. Just think about it, right? You're, 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 you're coming upstairs, you got your cup of coffee and the cat's right in front of you and you trip, right? And you watch your cup fall. So, so that's really what he's evoking there, right? This, uh, this scene, which I think is, is, is really kind of well done. 
and for, and the fact that it's it's the enemy, right? And he, but we don't know what happens after this because then Gregory gets into a different topic. Did he win against the fly, right? Did the did the fly go someplace else, right? Because we know he lost his drink and he broke his cup, but uh, it doesn't seem like much happened to the fly itself. So this is an, another place where we find, you know, Gregory, come on, give us a little bit more. Um, more flies. For a certain man in Borges, as he himself told us, again, this is a first-hand account, went into the deep woods to cut logs, which he needed for a certain job, and a swarm of flies surrounded him. As a result, he was considered crazy for two years. It should be believed that the flies were the wickedness of, sent by the devil. Right, so, so here's the, so why, why were you crazy, right? Well, because they're flies, you know, the flies were there. Um, so, so blame the flies, but, but here we have how ubiquitous demons are, right? And how dangerous they are. They can make you crazy for two years just by swarming around you. Frogs. Demons appear as frogs. And look at these cute frogs. I like frogs. But a lot of people don't, didn't like frogs. In fact, um, okay, yeah, I changed that there. In fact, you know, um, Origen, for example, he wrote about frogs and said that, that he doesn't know what their purpose is. He doesn't know what, why are they even there? They smell bad. And, um, and, and, and mostly they make loud noises all the time. And so if, if you get a, like a toad in your house, which seemed to have been somewhat common, you're not gonna sleep, I'm sorry, until you get that toad out of your house. And uh, they're very good at hiding. So, so the battle between toads and frogs and people has, has been you know, a, a, constant, a constant battle, just like the flies. So that makes sense that, that frogs would be uh, uh, associated with, with demons as well. So, so here's a story of Landolf. Right, who's, who's obviously a, a, a part of a Germanic, he has a Germanic name, right? So he's probably some sort of a, a Frank. So if, if, uh, if Landolf knelt on the ground, a, dread, a dreadful uh, swarm of frogs seemed to hop over him. And he also heard voices that clearly criticized him and said, Martin, whom you have called on. So he was talking frogs. The Martin who you are, have called on will be completely unable to assist you because you have been subjected to our power. Landolf did not move. Instead, he piously opposed these words with the sign of the cross, right? We're seeing, the, the, we're seeing a theme here. Um, and with great fear, he scattered them into the air. But that's not the end of the story. The demon, and which, you know, Gregory tends to just say him or it, and so, so he used to, sometimes figure out what he's talking about. But he's talking about the demon here. Uh, transformed himself into the appearance of a veteran soldier. And we know, we know who a veteran soldier is, right? That's St. Martin. Um, and so he came to Landolf and said, I am the Martin whom you are invoking. Raise and pray before me if you wish to recover your strength. Landolf replied to him, if you are the Lord Martin, make the sign of the cross over me, then I will believe. But once the demon heard the, the name of the sign of the cross that is always opposed to him, he vanished as if smoke. So the power there is, is uh, of this particular saint, all he had to do was say the words of the sign of the cross and he was able to dispel these, this demon here that uh, appeared as St. Martin. And, and it appears that demons uh, and the devil oftentimes appeared as Martin. And, um, and here's, here's one story, too, that happened about uh, during the bubonic plague of the, four fifth, uh, the 540s, which was a devastating plague um, uh, throughout, and it uh, decimated the population. So, uh, so, and this was not too long before he became a bishop, right? About, what, 30, 40 years. Um, and so, uh, so he's telling a story about what happened then. And, and listen to this story. So during the bubonic plague of which I've spoken, the devil falsely appeared as St. Martin to a woman named Lobella. He had offerings which he had wickedly brought, well, which would 
he said, save the people from the plague. But as soon as they, the offerings, had been shown to the holy man, Patroclus, not only did they vanish by a revelation of the Holy Spirit, but the terrible instigator of this evil appeared to the saint and confessed, confessed to all of his past deeds. So here, so this is this is somewhat problematic to find out. So is this what he, is this a demon like the, what we've been thinking about before, or is this a person that he's talking about that he's associating with being the devil, for the most part, right? So it it, it appears that this that I, I take the position that this is probably a person, right? So this is a person who is imitating Saint Martin. Who's, who says that he has the power of St. Martin. So sort of a, a, of a wandering man who's, who's there uh, trying to, uh, you know, to gain power within the community by saying that he's associated with Martin. And he says he has the cure for the plague, but we don't even know what they are, right? He doesn't say, say what these things are. I don't know, um, antibiotics, I don't know, it's not clear. That's probably not antibiotics, but it's definitely something uh, that he's he's trying it seems that he's trying to help the community but he was you know the the bishop was not about to take that right so here's because this is a challenge to his authority and one way you do that is you associate them with with the demons and we're going to see this kind of stuff again um uh, what else do the do, do demons and the devil uh disguise themselves as well christ right the tempter appeared during the night uh to deacon secundulus in the shape of the lord the deacon knew better and said, if you are Christ, show me the sign of the cross by which you have left this earth, and I shall believe you. And as the devil did not show him the cross, the deacon made the sign of the cross in his face, and the devil then immediately disappeared in disorder. But he returned with a multitude of demons and attacked the deacon with so much violence that he could hardly escape, meaning the deacon. Uh, at length, he the devil withdrew and did not disappear, right? So the, so basically he's being tormented by this devil um, in the shape of Christ. Uh, but what happens to the deacon? Well, the deacon afterwards lived in great sanctity and died when his time has come. So he obviously survived that. And he probably got, you know, he got a reputation, right, of being someone who uh, uh, challenges demons and he can, can, can survive, right? Can survive the... Uh, uh, the encounter. Demons also appear as women, a chorus of women. And so here's the, here's the interesting story. On an early Saturday morning, two young boys were sleeping in a single bed in Vortigo in the uh, village of Portier. They woke up thinking they had heard the ringing of the bell that was usually rung for matins. They rose from their bed and walked to the church. When they came into the courtyard of the church, they found there a chorus of women singing. When they realized that this was a gathering of demons, the boys were thoroughly terrified and fell to the ground. And as characteristic of their tender, tender age, they did not protect themselves with the sign of salvation. So one was deprived of his sight and the other of his sight and his mobility. So if they only were able to use the sign of the cross, if they only knew. So this is obviously a story to children, right? This is, this is for children to, to know that you, you need to know this too, because you can also fight against the demons. And, um, oh, by the way, just if, if you're concerned, he, they were eventually cured by St. Martin. So, so don't worry about it. <laughs> um, this is a fascinating story, and also because it tells us a little bit about Gregory, and we're going to learn some more about kind of Gregory's personality here pretty soon as well. But so there's this bishop named Aparchius of Clermont, and he had the habit of getting up in the middle of night to give thanks to God at the altar of his cathedral. So, he, you know, he's, he's the bishop, and that's his cathedral, so he goes there and he prays. One night when he went into the church, he found it full of demons and the devil himself sitting on his own Episcopal throne. So the devil was sitting on his throne, the, the throne of the bishop, made up to look like a painted woman. In other words, so he's, he's there looking all pretty, right? This woman sitting on his, his throne. Who, what, you, know, you hideous prostitute, the bishop says. Is it not enough that you infect the world with unimaginable filth? 
getting your stink on my throne. Okay, that's a little bit of a, a loose translation, but I think it's appropriate, which is consecrated to the Lord and sitting down on it with your revolting flesh. Leave the house of God right now and stop corrupting it with your presence. And here's the devil replies, right? Devil replies, since you call me a whore, I will see that you are always thinking about sex. When the devil said that, he vanished in thin air. And here's, here's Gregory. Okay, it's true that this bishop was constantly tempted by the lust of the flesh, but he was protected by the sign of the cross and the enemy was never able to hurt it. So, so I'm not sure what the moral of the story is. Um, I guess, you know, it's kind of an origin story of this, you know, why is this bishop always like checking out the ladies? Sure. Well, let me tell you. <laughs> Uh, so it's, it's kind of an excuse, right? it's, it's uh, kind of enabling in a sense, right? Uh, but we've seen that before in the church, right? Make excuses for it. So uh, maybe there are some common themes between the sixth century and, and today. Um, here's, a, here's an interesting story that it also is kind of frustrating to me because um, it, this first sentence, the Emperor Justin, who, by the way, he's, he's Justin, um, the father of uh, Justinian, right, Who's, who, who tries the reconquest of, of Rome. Uh, so he's a very powerful Byzantine uh, leader, was tricked by a magician because of some money. What? <laughs> when did that happen? <laughs> But anyway, so that's not even the important part of the story for Gregory, right? Here's, here's the story. So when, when the shade or shadow, the, the demonus umbra, it's kind of hard to, it's, it's like a dark demon shadow or something, but we see this sometimes. Uh, Gregory uses this language a lot. Um, and uh, so he, when, he, when the shade of a demon had been sent against him, uh, presumably from this magician about money, right? Um, for two nights, he endured unbear unbearable threats. So imagine this. So you've got a demon in your house for two nights threatening you um, all night long. <laughs> so, uh, but the third night, so he eventually decided, okay, the third night, I'm, I'm going to have to uh, put an end to this. And, and by the way, this whole thing is a, about what happened to the parts of the true cross, the, this, this whole chapter that this is from. And this is just kind of a, an aside. That he talks about and and one what what he's claiming here is that uh justin had the a bridle of that was in once in contact with the nails of the true cross so it's 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 kind of a secondary relic but it had been sort of energized by the the sanctity of this bridle was energized by the sanctity of the nails of the true cross which by the way someone thrown he's talking someone threw in a river um but um, so, so what he does, he puts, he puts this bridle on the, the demon's head. The enemy had no longer had a means to threaten him. So, so, they're, they're, so problem solved. But then once the instigator of this deceit was found, Justin executed him with a sword. Right? So there's so much in there, right? But he goes over it so quickly. But it's, it really shows us a lot about sort of his interest here. It's, it's about the true cross and how the powerful these relics are. And again, he's promoting his relic cults. Okay, so let's get to, let's get to it, right? What, did, uh, what, did, what does a demon look like according to, um, to Gregory? Now I have here on the left, remember this was from the Lovecraft conference. This is a, a, a painting that someone they're drawing someone did of a Shoggoth. Now Shoggoth is a, is a creature that's described in At the Mountains of Madness. They, they were these creatures created by the old ones to basically to be their slaves, and, but they took over. It's a long story, but anyways, uh, what, what, I, what I think is interesting about this is it kind of fits the description a little bit. Not that there's necessarily any relationship, because I don't think Lovecraft ever read Gregory. Uh, he may have known about him from footnotes of, of Gibbon, but he, he definitely did not have any kind of a, uh, interest in Gregory. He would thought Gregory was just this you know, dark age Christian writer who cares. But the description I wanted to fo focus in on. And um, it's an interesting encounter. So one day while on a journey, 
Saint Nicetius descended from his horse to answer the call of nature among the thick bushes. Okay, folks, you know, there's, there's no gas station, right, on the side of the road. There's no, there's no place, there's no 7-Eleven. You got, you got to go, you just go on the side of the road. That, that's, that's the reality of every, all time up until maybe, you know, I don't know, 100 years ago, right? But anyway, so what happens? There appeared to him a frightful shade, again, the umbra, of great height, a huge size, black in color, with an immense number of sparkling eyes, like those of a furious bull and a large mouth that stood open as if ready to devour the man of God, right? So, oh gosh, there's gonna, must be, there's gonna be a battle happening, right? Well, when he made the sign of the cross against it, it vanished like, in a, like ascending smoke. There's no doubt that it was the, uh, that the prince of crime had shown himself to him. A little anticlimactic, right? There's, you know, where's the battle? Well, but what it really shows is the power of faith, right? Power of, of, of Trinitarian theology against this horrible demon that all you need to do is give the sign of the cross and they're out of there. So what else do demons do? Um, we saw they make people immobile with fear, annoy them, insult them, threaten, tempt them sexually, cause blindness, blindness, loss of motor function, and generally make people go crazy. Uh, of course, they also possess people, which we'll talk about, but they also do other kinds of terrible things, right? So here's, here's an interesting story about uh, what demons do at death. Okay, so because even when you're dead, and, and even if you're a saint, you still have to encounter a demon at least one last time. So uh, Saint Cervantius, Bishop of Cologne, said, my lordship Martin has migrated from this world. Now, Martin had lived about 150 years before, uh, before Gregory, but he, but, but he was the patron saint of his area. So he, he, what he's really doing here is probably talking about a previous story. I don't know where this source comes from in particular, but I'm looking. Um, so, uh, so when he migrated from this world, and, and now the angels are escorting him on high with their chanting. And when there was a brief delay in hearing this, this chanting, the devil tried to detain Martin with his wicked angels. But once the, dis the devil discovered nothing of himself in Martin, he was dismayed and left. What therefore would happen to us sinners if this wicked faction wishes to harm such a bishop? All right. So... The, these demons, they don't mess around. You need to be, you need to be pious, right? You need to be faithful because they even try to get, um, get Martin. But what's, what's really interesting about this that I wanted to point out is that how, how the angels chanting gets to Martin. Let's look at this. So, uh, so, so Martin's di Martin dies, right? His soul go starts going up to heaven. The angels start chanting. So when they're, but before he can hear them, there was a brief delay in hearing this chanting. So the speed of sound, folks, between the time they start chanting and it reaches his ears, the devil tried to detain him with, with his wicked angels. But then Martin was able to continue on. So that's how fast demons are, right? In that interim time when that sound travels from however far away the angels are, I don't know how far up the angels are, right? But there, but but there is, but there is a recognition that sound takes time from when it's being spoken to when it gets to your ears. So he you knows some science, right? He's got some science behind him. Okay, what else do demons do? Well, they make you bite yourself and dance, and sometimes help make abbots. Let's listen to this story. The slave of, of the patrician Aurelianus was possessed by a demon and suffered from a terrible calamity, which he was, which he often, which often he bit himself with his own teeth. He was brought to the church of St. Martin. After he announced that he was burning because of the saint's power, right, because the saints there are trying to get the demon out of it, he danced through the entire church. Three days later, so he's in the church for a uh, Four days, right? We should count that day, well, at least three days. Um, for, for three days being in the church, then he was cleansed and left. 
So this is what you would see if you went to a church, by the way, you went to Church St. Martin. People would be hanging out, uh, you know, dancing, uh, convulsing, uh, wanting to be cured. So he was so strengthened with the reward of his faith that he was tonsured and achieved the rank of abbot and presided over a monastery. So what, what a good ending for him, right? He's, he's, he's possessed by a demon. He goes to the church. He was once a slave and now he's an abbot. So some, some social mobility there, uh, definitely, that shows us, right? So, um, but we're gonna see another example that is kind of similar, but it ha takes a different, different way. Um, what else do they do, right? Okay, so, and this, this, this reminded me of Slam. I, I had just seen the Circle Jerks with uh, seven seconds a few, well, it was in May, I believe. So it was before this, so I was thinking about this. But listen to this account. Possessed people danced throughout the entire church and Vericelli in violent spins. They believe they are afflicted with powerful torments. They leap in the air and with their hands strike and break the lamps, right? So they're dancing around and uh, they're, 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 they break the lamps that are burning as lights, right? You think, oh no, they're gonna get burnt or something. No, once the oil from the lamps splash on them, immediately the demon leaves and the people are cleansed. Oh, that's, well, that's a nice story, right? Um, you know, they're, they're not hurt. The, the oil from the, the holy oil goes on to them and it cures them. They also throw rocks. This is something they do. The malice of the one who fell from heaven. You know, there's always a, a kind of a challenge. How are you going to describe the devil and not just say the devil? Well, here's an interesting way. The malice of the one who fell from heaven has always laid traps for mankind. And he attacks these servants of God and strives with the help of his ministers to call them back from the road which they have taken, right? In other words, so he's, they're trying to get them off their holy track, right? Trying to tempt them. For every day without ceasing, demons threw stones at two young brothers who went to the Jura Desert to pray. Every time they bent their knees to pray to the Lord, immediately a shower of stones thrown by demons fell on them in such a ways that they were often wounded and endured atrocious torments. Wow. That's, so they're, they're being uh, basically stoned there with rocks while they're trying to pray. Uh, but again, being so young, right, targeting the young people congregation they had not yet reached maturity began to fear those daily attacks not being able to support these torments any longer they decided to go home oh right so there's the it looks like the did the demon win the day i don't know um some scholars think that this is not a, a demon these are these are people throwing rocks um it's unclear, but it, 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 I think it makes a nice little story, basically showing, you know, even the young people, you need to watch out for the demons. Um, also, what else do they do? They encourage suicide. And, and so, you know, suicide has always been an issue, right? And uh, um, this, is, this is a story that, that describes that. So in some place, and this again, Gregory, this, this is some place, he doesn't need to say where it is. Uh, at the prompting of a demon, a man ready to noose to choke out his own life. So he's being encouraged by a demon to kill himself. Once he discovered a hidden nook in the room where he was about to do this, he wrapped the rope around the beam and began to tie the noose. But all the time he was calling on the apostle Paul and said, help me, St. Paul. But behold, a, bit, a hideous black spirit whose likeness was like nothing except a demon appeared to him and urged him on saying, come on, come on, don't delay, quickly finish what you started. But although the man went on to try to choke out his own life, he kept crying, most blessed Paul, help me. When the noose was finally ready, the spirit urged him to pull it over his neck. But suddenly another spirit, like the first one, appeared and said to the first spirit who was near the man, Flee, you wretch. Behold, the apostle Paul is on the way. After being invoked by this man, behold, he is there. Then both spirits vanished, and the man came to his senses. On his, his trembling chest, he signed the cross of the Lord's power. His cheeks were flooded with the torrent of tears. He regretted having attempted suicide. So, you know, it's a happy ending. But what's interesting here 
is that we don't see Paul, do we? Paul never, Paul has just said that he's here. Uh, this, this other spirit was uh, probably an angel, right? Because we know that angels and demons are similar in, in, in their kind of physiognomy. Uh, but what, what we see here is that, um, you know, Paul is on the way. After being invoked by this man, he's here. But we don't hear that he's actually there. So the fact that he's, I guess, you know, St. Saint Paul, Saint Paul's a pretty important saint. Right, so he's probably got other things to do, but uh, but he's able to. Th this other spirit was able to trick the demon for this guy to help him from uh, committing suicide. This is a this is an interesting story, and, and in my class we've been watching um, The Exorcist uh, and analyzing it, and and if you remember the scene from The Exorcist when. Um, Father Marin comes in, right, for the first time to see Reagan and all the insults, right, that he gets. And they, they, they tend to be very, very homophobic insults, by the way, if you think about what it is that he's saying about him, about a Father, Father Marin. But, but, demon, but the idea there is that demons insult people, right, and, they, and that's just what they do. So, and this is a, this is a story, uh, uh, the first hand account by, by Gregory. So one evening after dinner, the landowner Eberwolf, right, so another kind of Germanic uh, person, was drunk and he came to St. Martin's Church while we were singing the evening service. He entered in a rage and immediately attacked me with abuse and curses, scorning me, among other things, because I wished to keep him away from the lid of the Holy Bishop Martin's tomb during the service. So this is the middle of church. They're singing a song, and here comes this drunk guy, right, shouting and uh, insisting to be able to go to the uh, to St. Martin's tomb. Why does he want to do that? Because we heard before that that's what you do, right? You go if you if you're possessed and and you're you're sick, you go to the tomb of Mar St. Martin, and you'll be cured there. But I was outraged, Gregory said. I was outraged that such madness could possess the man and tried to calm him with soothing words. But when I realized I could not calm him down, I decided to be silent. Re realizing that I would not respond, he turned to the priest, right? So his, uh, his, his sort of companion that he's uh, conducting the service with and, and overwhelmed him with abuse. For he attacked both of us with disgusting language and countless insults. But when we saw that he was possessed by a demon, what did they do? We left the holy church and ended the disgraceful scene and the service at the same time. We were especially outraged that he had become so abusive before the tomb of Martin, disrespecting the holy bishop. Huh, right? Well, why, why would he respond like that? I mean, he was just, he tells in other stories that that's what you do. So interesting, right? Interesting. What else do demons do? Well, they help you find tombs of saints, of course. Uh, okay, well, so two possessed men came to the church of St. Martin. Okay, so, so these are men who are possessed. These men clapped their hands and began to cry out, the most best blessed solemnness is buried here in a hidden crypt. Uncover the tomb of the friend of God. When you have found the tomb, drape it with, cloth, with cloths, light a lamp and celebrate the ceremony owed to him. If you do what we say, the tomb will benefit the region. As they said this, they cried loudly and attempted to dig up the ground with their fingernails. And of course, this started a spectacle, right? So the locals came out, what's going on here? And then eventually, I guess someone gave them a hoe so they could actually start digging so they're not using their fingers. Uh, and they exposed a crypt. Now, these, so these are possessed people, possessed by demons, talking about the saint's tomb, helping them find it. Uh, they descended by a series of steps and found a huge tomb. The men who were still possessed testified that this was the tomb of the most blessed solemnness, but these men then departed soon after regaining their senses, and we never hear from them again. <laughs> right. Why would demons know where a where a tomb is, right? A tomb of a saint. Why would they promote it? Um, now, now, I mean, I don't want to get too much detail, but but certainly there's. This sounds a lot like you know, 
the Garrison demoniac, right? Because the Garrison demoniac and Mark, um, the only pe- the only the only the, the only beings that know that Jesus is the Son of God are the demons. So they they know how to detect uh, sacred people, right? So this is an interesting kind of twist on that, but it also has, a, I think it has a similar idea behind it, is that demons are able, they're very smart, right? And they're able to find um, tombs and uncover them and, and tell the truth. This is, we just have a few more slides left, and then I hope we have some time for discussion because I'm interested to see what you're thinking here. Um, in Italy, Right, so Italy for Gregory is not a good place because Italy was dominated by the, the Ostrogoths, right? And they were considered to be Aryans. And, um, and there's a lot of chaos going on in Italy throughout the sixth century. It was not a good place to be. Um, but, also, but, so, but also the fact that there were Aryans from there was really something that Gregory was, um, was interested in and he wanted to caution people about. All right, so, and this also describes a little bit about what, what Aryan Christians did in, in terms of the, their church services. So in Italy, the widow of King Theodoric and their daughter, right, King Theodoric the Ostrogoths, uh, of the, the, he's an Ostrogoth, be, belonged to the Aryan sect. And it is, as it is their custom of those going to the altar, the royalty receive one cup and the lesser people keep another. Or the, or the lesser people use another cup. And I think he's pointing that out because he wants to show his congregation, they don't do that, right? They, uh, the, the bishops and the priests and all that, we all, we all drink from the same cup. But let's see what happens. Uh, the daughter put poison in the cup from which her mother was going to receive communion. So the daughter poisoned her mom. Her mother drank it and she immediately died. There's no doubt that such a fate is from the devil. How would the wretched heretics answer to the charge that the enemy dwells in their holy place? But as for us who confess the Trinity, uh, similar equality and omnipotence, right? The Trinity, which means uh, that, uh, uh, you know, the the triune nature of, of God, even if we should drink a deadly swig, right? Even if we drink poison, uh, wine, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, the true and uncorruptible, uh, uncorruptible God, it would do. It would not do us any harm. So, so you, you're immune from poison if you give the sign of the cross before you drink poison, and and of course you know this is this really is kind of within the context of the ordeal, the medieval ordeal. And, um, and uh, you know, the, the trial system, it, we, we hear that today and things like, you know, throwing a witch, you know, it's a witch. If she, you know, if she floats, she's a witch. If she sinks, she's not. So it's, it's these, these kinds of uh, actions and activities that prove innocence because it's really God that's judging. And, um, and, and, and so actually, you know, this reminds me of another story that, that about these, there's these two, Gregory tells the story of these two uh, priests. One's an Arian priest and one's a Catholic priest. And so they're arguing about who's right, right? Who's, who's correct about the Trinity, whether it's Trinity or whether it's, you know, God is superior to the, to the son. Um, and then uh, the, the priest, uh, the Catholic priest says, I'm gonna, let's just settle this once and for all, right? So they go to this boiling cauldron of water, right? So, um, and then the, the Catholic priest takes off his ring and he throws it into, uh, into the boiling cauldron. And the Catholic priest says, if you reach your hand into that cauldron and you are able to pull out the ring without it hurting you or burning you, then I'll, I'll admit that you're right. And the Arian said, yeah, well, you do that first. He said, no, you go first. So eventually then the, the Catholic priest says, okay, I'll go. But the Catholic priest comes out and the Arian sees that his arm is completely coated with some kind of oil. Right, it's all coded. So basically, so if he were to put his hand in there, the idea is that he wouldn't be burnt. 
So what, what, and then they, the, then the area says, what are you doing? You got oil all over there. That's, that's cheating. And then a, the deacon comes in. So what are you guys arguing about? And the, um, and uh, the, the priest says, well, we're, we're arguing about, you know, who's correct. And if you put your hand in there um, and you pull it out, you'll be, uh, you, you'll show that our faith is, uh, is correct. So the deacon goes in and he puts his hand into the boiling water and he's reaching around in it. And he's, he's in there for an hour looking around because he can't seem to grab it. So Gregory says he's, he's in there for an hour and then he eventually pulls it out and then he pulls it out and says, oh, here, here it is. And the area says, wasn't it hot in there? And the, um, and the deacon says, oh, you know, it's a little warm on the top and the bottom is, it was very cool. So the Aryan says, well, I'm gonna go show that I have my faith. And then the Aryan puts his hand into the boiling water. And of course he pulls it out immediately and all of his flesh has come off of his bones, right? It's all completely, he's just a skeleton hand. And, um, and so it, it showed, right, who is, who is correct in this argument. But, but for that story, I think who the target of the, the story is, is really about the guy who, the priest who put the, um, the oil on his hand, on his arm, because he, did, he, was, he was not strong in his faith. So this is, this is a, that was a story for the, for the priest. But anyway, so I, I just wanted to share that story because that's another one that I really like. Um, let's see. Uh, here, here's an interesting, and this, I think this is about the last one. Uh, one night, so so this is this is um, uh, Saint Venatius, right? So he's returning from his oratory, um, which we saw before. Remember, we saw the rams there. The one saint was going in there, and he dispatched the demons pretty quickly. Um, so wh wh when this this particular priest was coming out of of his oratory, he saw his room full of demons. And he said, as you do, right, if you see a room full of demons, where do you come from? <laughs> Seems like a logical question. Well, from Rome, they said. Uh, we left yesterday in order to come here to Borgias or Venatius' room. So they, came, they left yesterday to come here. Hmm. And, and he said to them, go away, detestable creatures, and do not approach a place where the name of God is invoked. At these words, the demons vanished in smoke. Uh, what I, I I sort of became obsessed with this idea. How so? We're going from Rome to Borges in one day. How are you do that, right? So it I mean, from Rome to Borges, that's about more than seven hundred miles, right? So they have to. Uh, you can drive from Rome to Borges. Uh, it's, it's about seven hundred miles. That's how I found out on the one of the Google Maps, because uh, there's a road through there. Um, but. So when would they have left, right? So did they leave at nine o'clock? And let's, let's just say they left at nine in the morning yesterday, right? And then they uh, got to his house, let's say it was 9 p.m. So that's, you know, 36 hours. So I calculated in order for the demons to go from Rome to Borges in that time, they'd have to travel at a constant speed of 22 miles an hour. Right? And that's if they didn't like stop along the way Right to you know to go scare a bunch of other Catholics, uh, you know because you know why not? Uh, but also the question is why didn't they just materialize? That, that's what they seem to do before. Uh, but but he makes a point of saying they actually traveled and it took them a day to get to to the house. Uh, another interesting aspect of Gregory that really gets you know the scholars always. That's why we're always kind of scratching our heads. What is he talking about? <laughs> but it's it's also kind of you know in a, in a fun way. Uh, so I I, I really enjoy uh, Gregory, as you can probably tell. Anyway, so conclusions: demons can appear as just about anything or anybody, as we've seen in Gregory. Their real form is dark and scary, right? We saw from the kind of the Shoggoth looking thing. Uh, they have some sort of a physical substance like mist or smoke. They can physically interact with people. Um, but they're easily dispatched by the sign of the cross, almost to the point where the story, it seems like it's, it's going to be something exciting, and then it just ends, right, with, the, uh, with their just in smoke. So, that, so we can tell that, that's not, that having a large battle or something like that is not important to Gregory. It's about showing the power of faith. Um, also, they, you know, they perform, uh, these stories perform a pastoral function versus false belief. And a, an attempt to strengthen people's faith. 
So these demonic, these demon stories are really stories uh, in order to um, sort of embolden the, uh, the congregation so that they know that even demons flee in fear from them. And that's how powerful they are. But there's one more thing to consider. Gregory's warning. So uh, just if, probably a pretty, uh, pretty, just not too long before he dies. He writes in his history, um, he's thinking about his legacy, uh, about his work. And I'm sure he's seen that other people's works had been split up or disappeared or used out of context. He says, I invoke you all by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ in Judgment Day feared by all of sinners that you never permit these books to be destroyed or rewritten, rewritten or by selecting some passages and omitting others. Uh, okay, I, I guess guilty of that, right? Otherwise, you will be left in confusion by the last judgment and be condemned with the devil. Rather, let them all continue in your time, um, complete and undiminished as I left them. So um, I hope uh, no curse befalls me just because I wanted to share this with you. And um, the end. Okay. So I see, I'm sorry if I missed some of your, uh, your questions there in the chat because I couldn't see anything. I have this little MacBook Pro that's a very small screen, but. Um, I don't think any of them were questions. They were more like uh, <laughs> puns and snide comments. Oh, good. Okay. <laughs> yeah, well, that, I think it's appropriate. Yeah, yeah. I am dancing, right? Well, I, I, I joke that, you know, the answer is we just have to be cross of demons. <laughs> It's a bad pun. It's really, oh. really, really awful. I actually do see some questions in the. Yes, chat. some just popped up just now. Yeah, we do have questions uh, mm. from Julian. Okay. Oh, good ones too. Okay, yeah. So, who are the Aryans? So, the Aryans <laughs> are not the same as the Aryans with the Y. The, the, or the this is not the um, kind of the Nazi construction of the perfect race. Arians were followers of Arius, who was a, a, a bishop in the fourth century, who taught that uh, that God the Father was superior to God to, to the Son, and that's opposed to the idea of the Trinity, and and in fact he was um, considered to be heretical at the Council of Nicaea. Uh, because he obviously had a fairly large following as well. And this was a time when uh, theology was just starting to be uh, put together for the Christian Trinitarian theology. And Arians was, was a kind of an accusatory word used by Gregory and others for basically any heretic, but particularly a subordinationist her heretic, who, who uh, what that means is that, that Christ is subordinate to the Father. Um, yeah, the Ostrogoths were uh, were the the Goths that came into Italy and um, conquered it. I uh, believe the fifth century, late fifth century, and they were eventually repelled by uh, in the Gothic Wars. And there's a lot of chaos that ensued, but uh, but but they were a, a particular uh, Gothic group. I don't think they called themselves the Ostrogoths. Uh, they were just we we come up with these names in order to categorize these particular these Goths. Uh, and the Vis Visigoths, right? Um, uh, any connection between uh, demons, demons and frogs with the big biblical plague of the frog? Yeah, that's that's a good point. <laughs> um, yeah, and uh, so yeah, the uh, the frogs come in and, and cause havoc in, in Egypt, right? With with Pharaoh. Um, so I think that's it. But also, you know, if you read Revelation. You'll see that um, I, I don't know, maybe Revelation eight or nine. I, I'm not exactly sure, but there's a scene where uh, where unclean spirits appear as frogs coming out of the mouths of the beast, um, the Antichrist, 
and some of the and one other I forget what it is, but but it is but frogs are mentioned in association with uh, demons in the Book of Revelation, and Gregory really is is sort of immersed in in the Bible stories. Uh, you can really tell. Um, any connection between Landolf and Tolkien's Gandalf? Well, I, I, yeah, I think there, there's the similar linguistic uh, hints uh, that uh, that Tolkien uses, and, and Tolkien, you know, is an Anglo-Saxonist, and he certainly knew about what was going on in uh, in Europe at the time. But but, but I'm not sure specifically. That, that's an interesting question. But a, a number of uh, of uh, people's names in the early Middle Ages, Germanic people's names kind of look like that. Sure. Yeah, yeah. It's really excellent, excellent. Yeah, I, I, had, a, I had a question. Um, when the demons were, were trying to abduct St. Martin uh, as he ascends to, to heaven, uh, yeah. this idea of the demons attacking uh, as one, you know, passed on, my question is, I know that in the East, there is this idea where you ascend to heaven, uh, like Mount Athos, uh, yeah. and there's various toll stations on the way up. Um, is there that idea of toll stations where demons are at each, each toll uh, in, referred to at all in, uh, in Gregory of Tours or in writings from, from the West? Latin West, that's my question. Yeah, well, it, it's definitely not in, in Gregory. Gregory doesn't go into much detail. And Gregory's not a theologian. He's not necessarily interested in those kinds of, you know, structure of the world kind of stuff and cosmology. Uh, but he is interested in, in how demons are still uh, like out to get you even when you die. And not only just you, but the, the, the most powerful saint in town they're still trying to get him when he dies in that interim of time between sound coming out of the angel's mouth to hitting the ears of of, Gregory, of, of, of Martin. Um, but yeah, I, I'm trying to think of uh, any anyone else in the West that may have that kind of a, a cosmological idea. And I, I don't, I, not that none, nothing comes yeah. to the same. It's yeah. much more sophisticated. I mean, I think the Greek, the Greek theology um, uh, in the, in the Greek East is, is much is much more sophisticated, particularly at this time. Um, the West becomes to be, begins to sort of be you know more interested in the, the Bible, right? And more interested in the, the hagiographies and the saints cults. And Augustine, right, becomes very powerful in his his view. And, and Augustine doesn't really talk about that as far as I know. Um, and I maybe look at some of his commentaries. Yeah. Uh, but it is an interesting question about the, the various levels there that are oftentimes thought of as in the various realms of heaven or the, the ether just, be, just below, right, the realm of the divine. Great. I, I, I mean, I, I, yeah, there's more questions, I think. Uh-huh. Yeah, I mean, hi. Hi, do hi, Dr. Quinn. Sure, hi, Alex. Uh, I just had a quick question. You mentioned how, like, in the beginning, how a lot of these stories from, uh, a lot of these, these tales that uh, Gregory is telling may have been adapted from, like, his, from, like, things he said to attract people to his sermons at tours, the cathedral, right? Mm -hmm. um, it, it, that made me very funny. Like, is there any other examples of showmanship or, like, kind of the church as like it's particularly outlandish entertainment from that era that you think are relevant or that Gregory also participated in? Yeah, that was something I was thinking about too before I presented that what what did people do for entertainment? Um first of all, I mean I think life was pretty difficult to begin with, life was nasty brutish and short, right? To quote Hobbes, the, the life expectancy, like, I, like I'm, I'm in my mid fifties, I would have been ancient to them, right? a very old man. Uh, but um, so what did people do? Uh, certainly they, there were games, we, we know that they played games, um, certain dice games that we have some archeological evidence for. Um, 
but it's really not until we get into later in Europe that we get sort of the, um, you know, the knights, the knights, uh, you know, skill challenges that they had. Um, you know, what are those called? The contests uh, that came later. But at this time, there really was not anything other than just kind of waking up and doing what you got to do to eat that day. Um, uh, and uh, make sure that your soul is preserved so you go to church. Um, and because most people didn't read, right? Most people couldn't write. Um, everything was kind of a subsistence kind of uh, farming uh, at the time. So it, it, it doesn't seem like it would have been that fun <laughs> to live during that time. I'm sort of happy to be living in the time that we have, even if we have too many gadgets. I think, and all of our students are just, I, I went to my class today and, and they all know each other, but they're all standing there just looking at their phones. What are they looking at? Why don't they talk to each other? You know, I don't know, but at least there was kind of a closeness of the community, right? mm. something that we don't have the same uh, uh, that, that they have. It's, this, it's kind of a small town too. It's a real kind of a small town sort of atmosphere where everybody knew what everyone else was doing mills and stuff so um but yeah it's uh, it, it, i don't know if any entertainment there other than that oh. uh, andy has a question yeah andy it, it says he wrote it down oh andy does. okay uh okay all right it's making me read <laughs> also i had a question about saint martin being attacked while ascending to heaven the devil didn't recognize any of himself in mark yeah would this be the case for anyone ascending to heaven as their sins have been wiped away or as St. Martin supposedly already free of sin? Mm. Um, yeah, that's a good question. I, certainly he was, he was holy, and I don't know if he, he would consider himself free from sin. At the time, he was a saint, so he, he, he was holy enough to go to heaven. Um, but, the, but the fact that, he, that the devil did not see any of himself in the saint really just means that you know the saint is the opposite of the devil right the devil is darkness and and uh, filth and all this stuff and the saint is light and goodness um so it's pretty kind of a colloquial way because it's an actual it's a literal translation i didn't see any of himself in in in, in, in martin um so so yeah it's uh it, but but i think the point of that story was to tell us that we are not as holy as martin and therefore, we got to be careful of the devil at, at all times to be tempted and to be taken away and taken back to this world um, and worry about worldly things rather than the, the things of, that are divine. Let's yeah, see. yeah, because I, th I think the only one free from sin would be Christ, right? I don't know if um, the, the, the saints were completely free from sin. I, I don't know, James, do you have any perspective on that? Where saints considered to be completely immaculate, like uh, even, you know, Virgin Mary? Or... Well, again, I don't know of any in the West. In the, in the East, um, obviously, yes, there's this idea where one has become uh, so Christ. pure mm -hmm. uh, you know, through ascasis, that that purity has, has brought them the, into a, even though they're capable of sin, they're still sinless. And I'm thinking of St. Simeon Stylite. Right. Oh, okay. you, know, you know, he's he is now uh, both between heaven and earth and his substance is actually changing. Uh, he's, he's glowing, he's radiant. Uh, and so he becomes angelic. And in that sense, you have that in the East. But in the West, I don't know of in the, in yeah, the West. It doesn't have a similar concept. Yeah, it's, it's a whole other, other world. Which is, I, love, I, love, I love hearing your, your lecture so much because I, I do East. And I'm hearing the West. It's fun to to see that the the yeah, uh, it's very different. Yeah, the the fact that they're it's about the dead saints, right? It's about they're, they're more important when they're dead than when they're alive because when they're alive, they're only for a short time. But when they're dead, you could go to their tomb and still get all their 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 good deeds and feats that they can do for you uh, yeah. by just you know praying at the at at the at the saint's tomb or going there. And the, another favorite thing was going to get some of the dust off the top of the tomb. <laughs> Add a little water in it, drink it up, and that's a good uh, uh, cure for just about anything. Yeah, I, I love what you call it holy radiance. Yeah, that was good. Yeah, 
but the, the residue, you know, people you know, sticking in things. Oh, uh, there's Alex has a question too. Okay. I'm sorry, I'm making you read. I know. Let's <laughs> say okay, also any of uh, any of you, are, if any of you are familiar with the modern joke meme, the sign of the cross memes to, to be Uno reverse card or defeating demons is simply a comeback. No, you you say that's simply unbeatable by demon kind. So this is a an Uno an Uno game. It's a joke. It's basically a joke. So the you know, reverse card means that you, you basically reverse the turn play, but it's a joke. It became a joke, I think, in 2018. People would be just carrying him around at my high school. And uh, whenever you just like you and it's just like a joke. Like you you pull it out when you, like someone you basically pull it out when you to refute something, to jokingly refute something or say no you basically. That's the mm. meme associated with it. But it it, it really strangely shines through with like it's an unbeatable like a it, it, it taken seriously it's an unbeatable statement the sign of the cross that really can't be can't be undone by anything demons can do yeah i just tried to put it in like a more jocular tone mm -hmm. that's yeah. interesting yeah thanks for sharing a bit of pop culture but yeah, I have I have a I have a very pressing question. I um I don't ask too many questions. I know because others will have that. But, uh, you 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 started developing something that was really got my interest, and that was these men who are possessed, presumably by 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 demons, finding a tomb of a saint, yes. and who's obviously considered good and pure and holy. And they're even like, you know, trying so hard to uh, get the same, uh -huh. you know, cover it. You know, you kind of, you kind of think to yourself, maybe they're trying to destroy it. You know, <laughs> at the same time, I don't know. But, but I'm, 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 I'm just, I really want. Is there? You know, you mentioned the connection to the demoniac and Mark. Can you unpack that a little further? Because that just seems to be a very interesting contrast where demons are helping finding the site of a saint because you wouldn't think that they would want to do that it, it, is, it is puzzling isn't it and uh it's something i really want to explore more to find out any more kind of um maybe he's he's working off something else he's he, there's some other source that he has but it's it's one of those things that gregory will say that you're kind of scratching your head. It's it, it, he says that a lot. Just like you know, remember the quick quote about Justin, mm -hmm. and he, you know he had this deal with the sorcerer about money, and then that was it. And then he talked about something else. Like you know, he just kind of evokes these things without explaining them, and that's why some people get really frustrated with that. Um, but but that's something I'd like to pursue more, actually. Yeah, that's an article. Yeah, that is one. It really is. You yeah, know, what, they be, by what is what's going on there? Yeah, because I mean, you, you think of, of Solomon, right? You know, who, who commands the demons, and they're they're building the temple of Solomon, right? Yeah, but they're but they're compelled to do so through you know, mm -hmm. uh, through magic. But in this case, this they're they're demons of their own volition. Yeah, they just show up and say, <laughs> "There's another saint buried down here," and yeah. they dig them up. They're even going to dig them up with their fingernails, and uh, so yeah, it's it's odd. Yeah, you, you you would think that maybe they would question the credibility of that saint. They're going, well, you know, the, 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 the yeah, maybe the, the saint we don't want to die after all. Yeah, but but obviously he was an important saint because people would uh, would honor him and, and go to yeah. the crypt. So, well, it looks like we're at nine thirty, right? Is that is that how long we're going to? Yeah, whatever you want to do. Okay, so I don't know if are there any other like final questions that we have. I had a question. Sure. I was wondering, um, when did this, the demons go from being so weak that anyone could dispel them just by making the sign of the cross to being so powerful that you needed, you know, specially trained priests to do it? Yeah. Yeah, because you don't need a priest, right? You don't, you don't need one in Gregory's world. You can do it yourself. If the kids knew how to just make the sign of the cross while those ladies were out there, the demon ladies, they could have gotten, they wouldn't have been hurt. Well, it, it really starts uh, later on. We, you know, the Malleus Maleficarum really starts talking about the power of demons. And this is the 14th century, 15th, 15th century around there, when we get these witch crazes that start happening. And, um, and uh, 
Gregory doesn't mention witches. And uh, so, so this concept of witches starts coming in that I think is, is one line to see where, where demons become much more powerful. And, and also the church itself, we have to remember at this time is not like a, a, a hierarchical structure in the same way that it is today. There's the Pope, there was no Pope, right? It wasn't until Gregory the Great, a little bit, little bit after Gregory Tour that people, and it wasn't really till Charlemagne when Charlemagne allows himself to be um, anointed emperor by, uh, uh, by, by Bishop Leo of, uh, of Rome, mm -hmm. that, that the church itself becomes more of a predominant sort of hierarchical structure. And so, um, so the reason why you don't need priests in this one is because there's no structure set up that, that requires that. But once you get a, a church where you have a pope and you've got the, the, the archbishops and you've got all the cardinals and all these others where they need to, you know, it's like, like at my institution where I teach at, the more administrators you get, the more stuff you have to do, right? And the more things you have to go through them in order to get anything done. So the more people you have at, at the top of an organization, the more they need to be part of it, right? So that they are then part of the decision-making process and that they have the authority and not you. It's, uh, it, it begins to be taken away there with the rise of the church. And when the church begins to be established as a hierarchical system under the papacy itself. So um, I know that's, kind of, I mean, that, that's a big question, but but I think that's probably central. And, and again, when you get the witch, witch craze, you have to go through the inquisition process right, right. to find out. And you have to go to court and, and things to find out whether someone's a witch or not, and your, the ordeals and things that happen there. So, so yeah, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very different era. If we were to go there, we wouldn't recognize this as Christianity, I don't think. Because, you know, Christianity changes over time so much, but th this is a, Christianity has always been a very dynamic, changing thing that is, you know, controlled by people, and uh, and we see that, that even today. So. Oh, oh, Derek has a question. He wrote it down. Okay. Sure. Okay. <laughs> I hope I didn't have missed the answer. This one thing that struck me odd was that demons were able to use images as something as maximally holy as Christ. Why was the sign of the cross considered more significant uh, than even that? Um, you de demons were able to use images as something max. What, what do you mean by use images that are maximally holy as Christ? I'm not sure I quite get that, but oh, he, he's funny. Okay, that is like when the demons were able to impersonate Christ. Oh, okay, yeah, well, well, remember, they're just impersonating, so they're not really. They, they have no real power uh, other than what Christ gives them, right? Other than what God gives them. And um, the sign of the cross is more significant because, again, the sign of the cross was also a symbol of, of the Trinity for Gregory and an affirmation of faith. So, um, and, the, and the story was that God's going to win anyway. So the demons have no chance. They're just there to make your life miserable. Um, and, but you can get rid of them fairly easily with faith and the sign of the cross. There we go. Okay. So I noticed that uh, even just by saying sign of the cross, yeah. uh, you can make demons go away. Why wouldn't everybody just do that? True. Yeah, true. Well, then we start talking about the relationship between what's being said in the text and what's really going on. And that's a bigger question, right? Is, is he describing some kind of a reality that, or is he constructing these stories in order to make a particular point and make a particular theological point, which is that, uh, you know, demons are, demons flee in the presence of, of, of faith, of true faith. Um, so if, but, if you met a demon and you said sign of the cross, and they didn't go away, that meant that your faith was not appropriate or at or well, well, yeah, uh, because, a sufficient mm -hmm. level. Because I think the the the, the person that said just the sign just said the sign of the cross was was that Saint Venatius? 
I believe that was him or one of the other, because these are also very powerful saints too. So it's, uh, but the people, the kind of the lay people, uh, they tend to, they have to actually make the sign of the cross. So maybe there's a certain holiness involved in, in that if you just say it or, or mention God, right? Because like the last story we looked at, you know, the, the, the demons from Rome disappeared just by saying, you know, in the presence of God, they disappear. Um, so, but again, these stories serve a larger purpose of, of, of teaching the congregation about the power of, uh, of Christ over demons. And, uh, and I'm thinking about also the power of the, the, the spoken word as, as opposed to the gesture. That's kind of interesting. You have that. Yeah, I thought so too. Uh, like the Jewish, you know, the, the power of, of the spoken word uh, in the, the Jewish mythology is uh, very strong. Yeah. So. Yeah, but, but you know, it's, it's mixed for Gregor. So sometimes if you just say the, the sign of the cross, it doesn't work, but you have to actually do it and then it works. Yeah, that, that's, 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 that, that's interesting in and of itself. You know, is it the ritual or is it the word or is it just the, what, what you're thinking or believing mm -hmm. as, as being exteriorized by either the a symbolic movement or the, 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 the articulation of it? So, mm -hmm. yeah, so fascinating. Yeah, lots of sides of the cross. And I, and <laughs> like, I guess it, I guess the end of these great moments, like it's this huge monster demon that's like, you see the sign of the cross. It's like it's over. It's like almost yeah. anticlimactic. Yeah, I was hoping for some some more happening because there's such a great description and it seems so frightening, and then poof, the, the and great, then, great yeah. right great buildup. Yeah, because <laughs> like, you're you know peeing on the side of the road, and then here comes this monster, and just he's gone. He's back on his way, just like the Rams. Right, they, the Rams are there attacking him. So if you're a ram, right, he was, sorry. I wasn't afraid. Yeah, yeah. Sorry about last week. Right? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what happened, right? <laughs> yeah, the, yeah. What was the team they were playing? They must have did the same thing to that, right? Just, they gave him the sign of the cross, and they vanished on the field. Yeah, but maybe they should throw rocks. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Or frogs. I'm oh, sorry. <laughs> okay, folks. Well, I, I really enjoyed this. This was a lot of fun, and thanks for listening. And I, I enjoyed your questions, and I was very happy to. Uh, to come and talk with you folks today. So um, that's great. So yeah. enjoyed your lecture very much. Thank Good. you. We want more. Okay. Well, we'll think we'll about some think more. about something else. So so give yeah, us more. Give yeah, us more. <laughs> <laughs> well, again, this is fun. So maybe maybe we'll do some more. Yeah, that'd okay. be great. I'll look forward to it. Awesome. Thank okay, you. well, we'll take care, folks. It's good to see old friends and new friends and everybody here that, that came. Thank you so much and the relatives and everything. So wonderful. So thank, thank you very you. much. Thank take you. care. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's Have great. a great evening. Thank you. Okay, bye-bye.